Welcome to Blackbriar Gaming. Today, we're going to look at the latest article about the soon-to-be-released epic Horus Heresy, more accurately known as Legion Imperialis. Because I can, I'll generally be referring to it as Epic Heresy from here on in. I am hyped for this game. Over the last few years, I've dabbled with Epic Scale Heresy miniatures just for the fun of it, because frankly, they're adorable. Uh, there's nothing cuter in this world than a tiny rhino APC the size of your fingernail. Well, now that hype is growing further as we've gotten our first decent look at some of Epic Heresy's new rules, because they look good. It should be noted that I never played any of Game Workshop's previous Epic scaled miniatures, uh, mainly because I'm not super old, uh, nor any of the community-driven game systems that have evolved since. I'm going to uh, into this one fresh and have decided not to look backwards. I'm not interested so much in comparisons, but rather whether this new system will offer something unique and fun. I think the setting and lore of Heresy just lends itself so beautifully to an epic scale miniature game. Uh, Heresy is all about, it's big, right? It's about space marine, space marine legions just absolutely walloping on each other, and epic scale you know, titans, titans marching across the battlefield in support, huge waves of endless power armored and, and mortal troops just smashing against each other, tanks everywhere. And it's just an epic scale miniature game works so well for what you want to do with this. Uh, when Legion Imperialis Epic Heresy got teased, I knew I was in. So, let's have a look at what we got today. So, the article that dropped, uh, Legion's Imperialis Core Concepts. This is how the new game plays. Fantastic. This is what I'm interested in. Obviously, the last few articles we've seen, we've seen all of the adorable miniatures. There are a few little tidbits about the game and how it was going to work. Uh, the, the miniatures, they're just so great. I'm loving what they're doing. Saying that, uh, all the Mark VI, sure, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna comment on that. It is what it is. Uh, would have loved to see different marks potentially. They're a bit more traditional heresy, but I understand why they've done it. They obviously want to tie into Age of Darkness box set and the Mark VI push that we've seen with Second Edition Heresy. They already had all the files. They've likely just downsized them. So I get it. I get what they're doing. Uh, but let's get into this article here. So. Uh, it's a game of monumental battles, fantastic, epic scale, uh, larger battles, titans, tanks, but how does it actually play? So first up, they're dropping, they're dropping knowledge bombs on us. So begin by choosing an army, recommended size is 3,000 points per side. I assume that 10 little attack marines, um, or, you know, attack detachment in this, um, will, will not be the same points as you would see in Heresy, of course. So 10 little tack marines are not going to set you back 100 to 150 points. Who knows, it might be for one little, you can see it down here, let's look at one of those little bases of tack marines with the bolters. What's that going to cost? Might be 20 points, might be 50 points, might be less. I don't know, we'll wait and see. It'll be really interesting to see what an army of 3,000 points looks like. Is this picture here that we're looking at, is that 3,000 points? Probably not, I dare say. Um, uh, probably the core box set that's coming out with this thing with uh, the Solar Auxiliary uh, Allied, uh, you know, Allied Detachment, whatever you want to call them. Detachment is not the right word there. Um, the Allied Force, perhaps. Probably that plus the Space Marines. Maybe that's what makes up 3,000 points. And that's why they've di decided to, to make the core box about as big as it is with the Warhounds in there as well. That's probably about 3,000 points. What we're probably looking at in this picture here, that's probably more like 1,000 points. Maybe. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Throwing stuff out there. We'll see what lands and, uh, and what 3,000 point looks like. But that's only the first sentence. Let's keep going. So it's played on a five by four foot battlefield. Now, there was a lot of conjecture. I'm in a little ACT, which is the, the territory that I live in here in Australia, in a little ACT chat on the side. And they're all talking about how big this game will be because when the terrain article dropped, we saw those terrain boards and it looked like the, the picture that we got was kind of six of them together, which is only, you know, two foot by what, three, I suppose. Um, it's, 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 yep, that makes sense. Am I doing that right? Yeah, that seems right. Very good. Uh, so, which is, which is not big. Um, now, it looked cool and it looked super cute uh, having that little board and the little miniatures moving around on it. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I keep saying cute. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a grown man and I can find tiny miniatures cute if I want to. So if you have a problem with that, please add it in the comments because I just love, I love to see the angst. Uh, but playing it, uh, and anyway, there was some, some 
Um, conjecture that maybe we'd only see this game played on a 3 by 2 or thereabouts little board and people were not happy with that because this game gives you such an opportunity for movement to be impactful so so many games workshop games just movement has so little relevance <laughs> um, depending on how they do objectives and certainly 40k over the last editions has gotten better with the way they do objectives heresy with the missions we got out of the core rulebook the the missions did not really lend itself to a movement based game and a good war game should be won in the movement phase that's my thoughts on that movement is meant to be important in a war game um, just rolling a bunch of dice and killing your opponent it's not the kind of game that I'm really interested in. I want to see huge sweeping flanking maneuvers. I want to see troops getting left behind in the battlefield in the middle of nowhere. I want to see transports actually make a difference. I want to see you know, aviation assets, you know, Thunderhawks and, and other aircraft. Uh, I want to see them and their movement and the potential of their movement actually be important. And here we're seeing... A five foot by four foot battlefield, that is awesome. Uh, I, why do they didn't just make it six? Okay, when I say awesome, I love that it's big. Um, big is good. It means that aircraft zooming across the battlefield will be so awesome. And I'm I'm so keen to build a White Scars army for this. Uh, so it will very much be all my army just zooming across the battlefield, dropping things out of Thunderhawks, jet bikes flying around the place. Why they decided to go five foot instead of six foot, I'm not sure. I think Games Workshop has been gradually reducing the size of their boards, um, particularly for, for latest editions of 40K, because having a play space that is six by four is difficult. It's a large size. Um, four foot still across is still difficult. That doesn't fit most dining room tables. But four, five foot by four, it's a strange size. Most gaming mats that you can buy from retailers, um, the neoprene, you know, versions that I'm talking about here, they are six foot by four foot. Sure, you just uh, you just come in on the sides a little. Or you know what? You know what? You just play on a six by four. That's fine too. Whatever. Either way, what I care about here, it's a, it's a weird size, but it's big. And that's what matters to me. All right, we're only, we're only two sentences in. Let's keep going. So the first step, allegiance, loyalist or traitor. Very good, constrain some of your choices. You'd hope so. Then pick your primary army list. Uh, firstly, interesting. Um, they talk about allegiance. Um, they don't talk about legion here. Um, surely there will be legion specific rules. But whether we will get them in the core rulebook, maybe we will, maybe we won't. Uh, I assume we would, but it's weird that they haven't noted that here. They haven't said, you know, pick a legion uh, for your army. So maybe, maybe it won't matter really how you paint them, at least to begin with. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm calling it now just because of what we can see here. Perhaps... Perhaps there are no Legion specific rules outside of your general loyalist or traitor uh, within the core rulebook, and that will come later in expansions. I'm hoping not. Uh, I'm hoping that each of the Legions does have their own little rules, but wait and see. Wait and see what that looks like. Uh, then pick your primary army list. Here we go. Maybe that's where. Here we go. At present, this means either the Legiones Astartes or the Solar Exilia, but other factions may join the fray in the future. Once again, you're either picking Legiones Astates uh, or the Solar Auxilia. You're not picking a Legion, right? But it's saying other factions may join the fray. Either by that, they mean you know, Legion-specific rule, Legion-specific factions, or they're talking about, of course, your Mechanicum, um, your, your Militia, uh, Demons. Uh, I mean, we haven't even seen Demons for 28mm Heresy yet. Imagine if they came out with little epic scale Demons before they did in 28mm. The outrage would be would be delicious and palpable. I don't think they will. Uh, but yeah, they're just I only thought about it just then, um, that we're, we're not seeing anything talking about Legion specific. Please correct me in the comments if we've seen that in a previous article. Uh, I will go back and, and do some reading myself um, to see if I can find that. But moving down. Okay, here we go. You're now ready to pick your units using two distinct components. So you've got a formations, very good, and detachments. Detachments are the main building blocks of an army similar to individual units in larger scale games. Platoons of infantry, squadron of tanks, batteries of artillery, banners of knights, and so forth. Formations are larger strategic groupings of detachments. Makes a lot of sense. Very good, selected according to the formation organization chart. Love to see a formation chart. 
that is one of the things that kills me uh, in latest in latest editions of 40k is the removal of formation charts uh, or at least them becoming so irrelevant uh, and so flexible that it really has no impact on the game. I've seen some silly armies uh, dropped on 40k tables and what all, all I want, all I want is some troops. I want some heavy support. I want some fast attack in there. I, w- I want a bit of all. I want it to be balanced. Give me some balanced army list, people. I want to see armies on the table like you used to see in White Dwarfs in the early 2000s and the 90s. That's what I'm looking for here. All right. And, and maybe even today. I don't know. It's been a while since I read a White Dwarf. Let's not get into that. You must select at least one formation from your primary army list for every 1,500 points of the agreed limit. Uh, at least for the 3,000 points, you're looking at two formations. Very good. So you're going to have multiple formations in your army and they have Dutch detachments inside of them. So here we can see the Legion Demi Company. Now it does talk how there are other uh, formations. You've got the Legion Armored Company and the Legion Aerial Assault. Super excited about that one. Uh, but this is the most flexible formation. In, and it's, look, it's actually pretty limited. It's got some interesting stuff in here. So uh, compulsory detachments, you got the HQ, you got some fluff text up the top, you got the HQ, you got the support and two core. Now, very good. So right from the bat, we can see that they're separating core detachments from support detachments. Uh, we've seen wording around those little plasma gun toting uh, detachments and the missile uh, missile launcher wielding detachments. Uh, we've seen coming with the core box set or the starter box, whatever we want to call it. Uh, they will obviously fall into support, whereas your tactical squads with their bolters uh, will fall into core. And then those little HQ detachments will fall into HQ. And that starts to give us a hint over how many stands, I guess. What what should we call it here? Um, how many bases? Yeah, sure. We can expect in a detachment. So... Uh, In a core, for instance, if it's just going to be tactical marines, we see them coming in the box. If we go back up here, how many many bolter-wielding boys can we see in this picture? A base is worth six, right? We can see, you know, one, two, three, uh, below those are below the contemptors, and then kind of above and to the left of the contemptors, one, two, three, uh, bolters. There's some more up the top, more up the top. But essentially, that starts to give us a idea on the size of the detachments. I'm expecting it to be something along the lines of, and it will be different for each unit, I'm sure. But let's, if we look at a core detachment, that being bolter wielding boys, I'm expecting two to maybe six, two to six bases of bolters. Now, uh, some other lads I've been chatting to, they're like, no, I want to see in one core detachment, I want to see 20 bases of bolter pigs just slam down on the table and crawling all over it. Um, Just a swarm of them. I don't think 20 is a reasonable number. It might be two to six, might be two to 10. It will probably be specific to the unit. Maybe support detachments will only be two to four. Uh, Who can say? Um, Maybe it will be be more than that. Maybe it'll be three to six. I don't know. We don't know yet. But either way, that's starting to give us an idea on how these detachments work and how many troops we can start to expect on the table. HQ, maybe it's just one. Maybe it's one little base of uh, of Space Marines with the banner there, as opposed to more. Maybe it's maybe it can be two. Who can say? Um, we've got the Terminators there, all on their lonesome in this picture. Maybe it's, it's one for Terminators, one to five. Maybe it's more. We'll have to wait and see. But then the optional detachments we've got here, Bastions, that's cool. Uh, little epic pieces of terrain that you can bring specific to, uh, to your army. Uh, what's the wording here? To your formation, to your allegiance? No, what's a, the, there we go. Uh, faction, yep, faction's the right word. We'll go with faction. Very good, so many so many new words. Uh, you've got core, you've got a couple of transports. Interestingly, dedicated transports, a little special rule for the formation here. Any legiones or studies detachment within the formation that contains only infantry models may be upgraded with legion rhinos as dedicated transport. So cool. Um, perhaps in other formations, you can't take uh, dedicated transports or maybe they cost uh, more money. Although it's not saying that they don't cost points here. Uh, it's just saying they can be upgraded, not that it won't cost you points. And Heart of Legion. Heart of Legion is... Sorry, I'm, I'm going all over the place with my mouse here. Compulsory core detachment slots in this formation must be filled with Legion tactical detachments. Very good. All non-infantry models within this formation increase their tactical strength by one. Yep when contesting an objective marker that an infantry model within this formation is already contesting. 
tactical strength. I love the sound of that. Uh, so objectives, obviously going to be super important in this game, especially with the large tables and the amount of movement that will encourage and just the size of the, the miniatures, right? When objectives will be scattered so far apart, um, relatively so to the miniatures on this table. That's really cool. Uh, so there you go. So infantry, uh, or that is, yep, will help your, your tanks and whatnot capture objectives in this formation. That's this little, little special rule. Other detachments we're looking at, uh, what do you got here? Vanguard seems to have the elite symbol next to it. Pretty sure that says Vanguard. Very good. Uh, one of the following light armor or air support. So really limited there. Either you're going to have some predators uh, or you are, you're you going to have some air, but not, not the two in this formation. And then one of the following artillery, a battle tank or heavy armor. Once again, so limited. So this detachment, this formation, I should say, all about your infantry uh, with a few little bits and pieces to come along for it. Very good, very good. That's great to see. All right, love it. Uh, most flexible, we've talked about that. Once your formations from your primary army list have been selected, up to 30% of your points may be spent on allied contingents. Interesting. Representatives of other forces, <laughs> the list building seems a little complex, and, uh, but I'm sure it'll be so simple when we have everything in front of us. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. Uh, representatives from other forces, including knight, households, and titans. Very good. So you, I'm sure there will be rules to just make a titan army at some stage, maybe even the core rulebook. But by the sounds of it, this game's going to be all about getting a whole bunch of infantry on the table, going nuts, a whole bunch of uh, you know tanks on the table with a few little knights and titans in the background. Love it. That's what I'm all about. Love to see some restrictions with list building to make it just resemble the kind of armies you would see on the battlefield. Good combined arms formations. That's what I'm all about. All right, turn structure. Each round is divided into five phases. The most important thing to know here is that both players act within each of these phases, taking in, in turns to activate their detachments in initiative order. Interesting. According to hidden orders, love that, that have been pre-assigned. Also love that. One of my favorite games, favorite war games is actually Star Wars Armada. And in that game, you have hidden orders for your ships that you have to pre-assign sometimes uh, three turns or more uh, in advance, um, which is really interesting. And they're kind of doing it here, which is really cool. Uh, I love that it's alternate activation. Uh, so firstly, phases, before, we, before I go deep down that rabbit hole, secretly assign one of your four orders, interesting, to each detachment. Uh, initiative, reveal orders and determine who goes first. And then you, you go backwards and forwards, very cool. Uh, take it in turns to move detachments ordered to advance, march or charge. And then in combat, take it in turns to shoot or fight with a first fire, then engaged. That's interesting. Then advance fire detachments. Resolve effects, fall back, test rally, calculate victory points calculate victory points that implies we're going to see some progressive objective securing which i really like there's nothing worse in war game design where the only time objectives count is right at the end of the games that is one thing well maybe there's a few things that's one of the things that 40k is getting right in its uh, in its later editions now using tokens placed face down next to their detachments players assign orders simultaneously and in secret it's so much fun. Both players reveal their orders once they've all been placed. There are four main orders, first fire, advance, march, and charge, plus fallback. Okay, very good. That's not a main order. It's a little sneaky side order, uh, which a unit can be assigned when they take heavy losses. Maybe you can assign that throughout the phase rather than just at the start. That would make sense. You then determine initiative by rolling off. This governs who gets to activate their detachments first. Uh, it, mm. Detachments, not just detachment. Okay. These two phases work in the same way. Players take it in turns to resolve the relevant order tokens by activating, here we go, yeah, detachments one by one. Orders affect how your detachments can behave during both phases. Now, just quickly, uh, this is implying to me that we will see alternate activations. Correct me if that's not how you're reading it, because it is a little vague, right? Um, unless it clarifies up here. Both players act within each of these phases. Hmm. So it might be that one person does all the moves and another person does all the moves. Then one person does all the combat, other person does all the combat. I don't think so. Uh, or maybe an initiative or... No, that wouldn't make sense. 
I think it'll be alternate activations, but I could be wrong. It is a bit vague. I would love to see it. You know, I'm going to go with these this detachment of tanks over here and six of my tanks go ham on the opponent and then it flips to them and they they get to do a detachment of infantry and they're, they're going to move around and, and try and flank me. That's what I'd like to see. Um, it might be that you do all of your movement, they do all your, their movement, uh, then you do all your combat, they do all their combat. I don't think so though. Give me give me alternate activating people. We might clear up as we go further through. Uh, players taken in turns to resolve relevant orders by activating detachments one by one. Yeah. It's still vague, isn't it? Orders affect how your detachments can behave during both phases. Advance is most flexible, allowing both regular movement and shooting, while March lets a detachment move double its movement characteristic, treble if it's an entirely infantry detachment, uh, but not shoot. Cool, so movement, super important. You can do lots of it, but you don't get to shoot. Charge allows either for a single movement or a double movement if it gets a detachment into base contact with an enemy detachment. Detachments with first fire cannot move, but they do get to shoot first. Finally, a fallback order prevents a detachment from moving. Instead, they'll have to retreat using the end phase. Hmm. Okay, combat is divided into three sub-phases. First fire, engagement, and advancing fire, which is to say, detachments with a first fire order get to shoot, then you resolve close combat, then everyone else gets to shoot. I really like this. So if you don't move, you get to shoot first, which makes a lot of sense. You're, uh, you're taking up position, you're standing still, you're waiting and watching uh, for that enemy to pop its head up and you're then unleashing firepower. Then you get into close combat. So then then all the, the people that were brave enough to jump on in uh, and combat sounds brutal. We get to that in a second. Um, and then everyone else gets to shoot. That is those people that were advancing and still shooting. Um, so it's some really interesting choices here and make some really interesting decision points about how you move, what you do and don't move. Um, and I like that it gives a nice benefit to close combat here because they're gonna get to do damage before everyone else is shooting. So often close combat is an oversight in, uh, in Games Workshop games and shooting is the main piece here. And look, I'm sure shooting is going to be very effective still, uh, but it sounds like combat going in the middle, kind of those two shooting pieces, uh, means that it's going to to really be a viable strategy. Uh, shooting works pretty much the same as it does in most Warhammer games. Weapons have a range, an amount of dice to roll, a target number for the hit roll, an armor penetration value, and traits. Very good, I won't go deep into that. Um, we'll look down here. This is cool. Uh, what I will say is that after you hit, uh, that being a five plus, for instance, for bolters, um, there is no to wound roll by the looks of it, which is which is great. Simplifies things down, makes things easy because there's going to be so much going on. The model, uh, the enemy then gets a save, which can be modified. Fantastic. Um, you'll see some traits down here. The light anti-tank, for instance, or the light trait cannot hurt heavy tanks. Very cool. Um, yeah, light anti-tank, maybe it can. Maybe that's a, that's a little different to light. Uh, but it looks like certain weapons aren't gonna work against certain uh, certain units, as they should not. Very good, shame on you, 40K. Uh, bolters should not be blowing up Bane Blades. Uh, let's have a look at the weapons here. I love the range that they're putting on these weapons. So you're playing on a five by four. I'm probably gonna play on a six by four, just quietly. Uh, but your bolters, they're only reaching out Eight inches. Now, I don't know what the movement is of these units, but I'm, I'm going to say it's probably going to be, if you're charging, at least six inches, right? So I really like that they're making the range of the weapons quite short. That really, once again, highlights that it will be a game about maneuver, um, getting into position, moving forward, not just sitting back statically uh, and unleashing hell upon the enemy. Uh, Predator Cannon, obviously a much longer range weapon. This is, you know, what's that? Is it a 40 inch, 48 inch range weapon in, uh, in 40K? Sorry, Horus Heresy, and, and maybe 40K, I don't know. Maybe it's still in there. Um, but here, only 18 inches, so they're really reducing things down, which is, uh, which is so nice to see. So you're going to have to be advancing with your tanks. You're going to have to be moving into advantageous firing positions. You're not gonna be able to just sit back and unleash fury, unless of course, you're a Reaver Battle Titan, and then you can do whatever the hell you want, because you've got a 60 inch range Volcano Cannon, and that's sick. Uh, all right, the dice, the amount of dice we get, we're looking here, it says Legion Bolters, one dice. Now, I am of course assuming that that is a stand or a base of five Marines, get that one dice for their Bolters, that would make sense to me, I assume that's what we'll see. You look at the traits, Assault and Light, Assault, I I don't know what that means. Maybe it means you get to, uh, and strange for bolters to have it, but it, maybe it means you get to um, 
I don't know, move and shoot it as opposed to not, I don't know, maybe um, assault, maybe you get to charge, you get to shoot it while you're charging, maybe you get to shoot it in close combat, nope, that's not right, I don't know, we'll wait and see, uh, combat however, we'll move down, we'll move down though, combat however, oh, let's talk about the to hit rolls, uh, so 5 plus to hit, not much is, uh, yeah, you're not gonna, you're only gonna hit with a third of your weapons there, but there's no to wound, of course, so... It doesn't look like shooting will be all powerful, is what I'm trying to say here with these low to hit rolls. Same, same Predator Cannon. It's only a 5 plus. Uh, yeah, it's got a minus 1 AP. But this is a pretty hectic weapon in uh, in Heresy. It's a pretty powerful weapon. But here in Epic, uh, Epic Heresy, it's it's not that it's not that good at all. It's a light armor tank, which then allows a lot of breathing room for those more powerful weapons which is great because something, one of the issues uh, that we've seen with Horus Heresy, the 28 mil version, is that those really powerful weapons, they just seem a bit flat compared to kind of that mid zone uh, and even lighter weapons with the amount of damage they do and the impact they have on the battlefield. And so your Thunderhawk, it kills, I don't know, with all the weapons bristling on that 900 point or whatever model, you're only killing, I don't know, a tax squad. It doesn't feel great, right? When uh, when another tax squad can do almost the same thing. Um, and yes, appropriate targets for appropriate weapons. But in this game, it's going to feel like there's a lot more design room and breathing space for uh, for those more powerful weapons to have a greater impact. And certainly we can look at it with the Reef of Volcano Cannon, which is going to just tear stuff apart. But only with one dice, right? Cool stuff. Interesting. Uh, it's going to really differentiate, I think, with what we're seeing here between those powerful units and your, uh, your standard bolter pigs. Reading on, combat, however, is a little different. Uh, the system harks back to the epic scale games of yore. Very cool, but also, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking about it. They're talking about it. In which individual models are paired off against each other. Then they make fight rolls, uh, rolling off with 2d6 and adding their close combat. No, just close assault factor. Ooh. The, the names of these things. It's a whole new whole new language that we're going to have to learn. Uh, models get a bonus if they're charged and the loser takes a wound. No saves allowed. Savage, people. Melee is seriously deadly and even tanks can be overrun. Melee is going to be very interesting in this game. It's going... It, it, okay, so... You know, not to not to hark on it, but in in real combat terms, in the in the real world, uh, shooting can only be so effective, right? Because cover, cover is really good uh, against bullets and such things. Um, so to uh, to overcome an enemy, you do have to move up on them, uh, and you do have to go in uh, with grenades and shooting from the hip as you are as you take their positions, uh, and that's what we're really seeing here is that shooting from range with your bolters is only going to do so much. You know, five plus to hit, you're only you're only throwing one dice. You've got the light trait, so you're not even really hurting a lot of the tanks. Uh, if you want to get in there and get the business done and move the enemy off their objectives, you're going to have to go in. Uh, you're going to have to get into melee. You're getting a bonus if you charge, so it's I love that. It's, uh, it's really encouraging. The aggressor, fantastic. Uh, and the loser... They're just, they're taking wounds, right? They're not getting saves. So much more deadly. Melee is going to be where you get stuff done. And that's awesome. Uh, when faced with uneven numbers, you'll have to pair off your models. Very good. But your outnumbered models will still fight each of their foes individually. And your opponent gets to roll an extra D6 for every time you've already fought. So outnumbering is going to be really impactful. Uh, this means that the most elite fighters can still be worn down if you're not careful to support them. So I'm just seeing waves of infantry go in there with their uh, their bayonets on their bolters or their, their chain bayonets even, I think we saw in the models up above, and just overcoming the enemy in wave after wave of glorious power armored might. That's sounding really great. That's all sounding really great. Uh, the rest of the article there, last sentences, uh, as you'd expect, there are also plenty of rules about maintaining detachment coherency, moving through terrain, firing overwatch, morale, and so on. Overwatch, very nice. Uh, so it looks like you'll be able to set, was that one of the rules? I don't think it was. Uh, not one of the rules, I should say one of the orders. Uh, I don't think it was. Uh, first fire, advanced, march and charge. So it'll be interesting to see it doesn't, I imagine it's not an order. Maybe it is. Maybe there's more orders than what they're giving us here. But firing Overwatch, uh, we've seen it in various games, done well, done not so well. But it's good to have the mechanic um, on, you know, sitting back, sitting back and waiting um, and getting a chance to, to spring a trap almost on your opponent. Uh, especially, once again, when the board is so big, 
this is the kind of stuff I want to see. I want to see some real tactics come into it more so than just I roll all the dice in my shooting phase and destroy your army. Sounds great. Everything I'm reading here sounds really interesting. Um, it will be interesting again to see whether they do go alternate activation or whether it is um, going with large chunks of your army uh, before your opponent does. We will wait and see. Please give us alternate activation. Um, that is what I'd like. It's just a better way to do these kind of games. But that is the article. That is the article today with lots of rules, lots of ideas coming out of that, lots of hints and tips about what this game will look like. And I think it's looking really good. Uh, I think I'm going to very much enjoy this game. But that brings us to the end of our Heresy Chats for today. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know in the comments if you're excited for Epic Heresy or whether you'll be sticking to 28mm. But importantly, make sure to keep rolling those dice and getting hyped for Heresy.